Hey everyone, and welcome to Faith. My name is Matt, and we are so glad that you've decided to spend your morning with us. If you're new, we want to welcome you to Faith Church. We're a community of broken people who are all on a journey toward Jesus. So no matter where you're at, you belong in the family. We would love for you to head to faithauburn.info and fill out a connect card so someone can reach out this week. And if you're ready to partner with us financially, the best way to do that is simply by going to faithauburn.info and clicking the button that says give. You can give a one-time gift or you can have a scheduled regular gift set up as well. But I just wanna say without your generosity, we could not do what we do, so thank you. Here's what's happening inside Faith Church right now. First is small groups. Coming to church on weekends and listening to the message is a great starting place for your faith. But your faith can't fully develop if you aren't surrounding yourself with real and meaningful relationships. And for that reason, we believe that the best way to grow in your faith journey is to join a faith group. Faith groups are a group of six to 12 people who meet together weekly in someone's home, all for the purpose of growing spiritually and connecting relationally. We have 10 brand new faith groups launching this fall. So if you're looking to connect and grow, head to faithauburn.info to sign up today. Second thing is Alpha. Alpha is a series of sessions exploring the Christian faith, and it typically runs over 11 weeks. Each talk looks at a different question around faith and is designed to create conversation. Alpha is for anyone, no matter where you're at in your faith journey. Um, classes will be held in our student center on Sundays at 9 a.m. starting September 25th. Third is baptisms. Here at Faith, we get excited every time someone makes the decision to be baptized. It's one of those unique moments where we get to see a vivid picture of what Jesus has done in someone's life. And this October, we're going to be hosting baptisms right here in our service and celebrating together. If you're ready to get baptized, or if you want to know more, head to faithauburn.info and click on baptisms, and someone will be in touch this week to help you take this next step in your faith journey. That's everything that's happening inside Faith this week. Let's continue in our service right now. Have you ever gotten a call from the boss at home? Have you ever gotten a call from the boss at home while you were on vacation? Have you ever gotten a call from the boss at home while you were on vacation on Christmas Day? I did. <laughs> I was a pastoral intern at my last church. It was 1986, and I had a couple of months left until graduating seminary, and then I didn't know what was next for me. My job as the pastoral intern would be over, and it was Christmas weekend. I was back home in western New York with my wife, Joanne, visiting my parents, and I got a phone call. Somehow, the senior pastor had gotten my parents' phone number and called me there on Christmas Day, and it wasn't to wish me a Merry Christmas. <laughs> he said, when you get back in town, I need to see you immediately. I wondered if I should just leave right then and there, you know, bye mom, dad, I gotta go, Joanne can open my presents, uh, you know, I didn't know what to do. Several days later, I got back to the South Shore and gave him a call and he said, hey, can you come over right now, immediately? I, I was literally shaking in my boots. We met at his office that very same day and he said to me, so you know, when you graduate in May, we've got no reason to keep you around unless, unless you can create a niche for yourself. And I've got the perfect thing. A group of singles just sat down with me last week and said rather bluntly to me, you know, the church does things for married couples and children and teenagers and even senior adults, but there's nothing going on for us, nothing being done for us. So I'm here right now proposing to you to start something for singles in the new year. And if it succeeds, then there's a very good reason to keep you around. <laughs> Thus began a ministry on the South Shore known as Unison. It was a singles ministry that would span every age group and was interdenominational, interfaith, and in a very few short years would climb in attendance to over 150 singles meeting together every single Monday night. And here's what made it work. After a very brief message by yours truly, the large group would then break down into small groups. And that was the lifeblood of the ministry. Single adults ranging from 18 to 88 would faithfully attend every single Monday night in spite of the poor preaching, and they would come exclusively for their small group and the relationships that were being formed there. 
It was all about community. And that was our secret sauce. And I'm telling you, it works. And it works then and it works now, not because of me, but because of all y'all. Because of your leadership, your stewardship, your willingness to give and create this incredible, incredible community. Not just for this generation, but also for the next generation and generations to come. Now the thing is, this was our dream from the very beginning here. When we started this over 30 years ago, from the very beginning, we knew that this was going to be essentially our core principle, community. From the very beginning, we wanted to create a community of Jesus followers who are in community and creating community together. A community of Jesus followers, that is men and women who are moving together in the same direction, asking, what does it mean to live in this world and follow Jesus, who are in actual relationship with each other, and were involved with each other in that same community? I mean, that's what we wanted to do from the very beginning. That's what we have done in a, to a certain degree. And if you're new to this church and you just kind of found us, maybe walked into our building, sort of feels big, maybe feels kind of linear, here's the thing. This is just the tip of the iceberg because at the core of what we do here, the core of who we are is not about sitting in rows. It is about getting into circles. In fact, from the beginning, we have said that circles are better than rows. Circles are better than rows. Circles are better than rows. There are things that can happen face to face across the circle that will never happen shoulder to shoulder. We're committed to be a face to face church, not just shoulder to shoulder. Now today I wanna to talk to you for a few minutes about why this is so important and there are so many reasons why this is important. But today I just wanna talk about one. I'm extraordinarily thankful for my own circle, and this has been one of the biggest benefits for us personally, of being in circles throughout my entire life. But the reason it's a big deal is because all of us, and I'm a part of we here when I say this, we drift. We drift. We drift. It's easier to stray the course than stay the course. We naturally drift away from everything that is holy and wholesome. Have you noticed that? I mean, you rarely drift in a good direction, personally. You rarely drift in a good direction in terms of your health. You rarely drift in a good direction in any capacity. If it's good for us, if it's good for us, we drift from it. Now, if we were a Pentecostal church, everybody at that point out there would have said, Amen. All right, okay, that's not bad, but... Maybe there's a little work to be done there. If it's good for us, we drift from it. Exercise, dieting, our budgets, healthy relationships. You do not drift. You do not drift into healthy relationships. If you want to be in a healthy relationship, whether it's a friendship, somebody you date, a marriage, you have to be intentional about it. When we drift relationally, we drift in bad directions because we all have a tendency to drift. Drifting is never good for us. And that intersects with our relationship with God, too. Our relationship with God takes some intentionality. Our relationship with God takes time. Our relationship with God takes a bit of discipline, a, a bit of delayed gratification. So consequently, if we're not intentional in our relationship with God, it begins to drift because the gravitational pull of life the gravitational pull of life is generally always in the wrong direction, right? The current of life. If you think in terms of current, the current of life rarely takes us in the right direction. That, in every area of life, think about this, in every area of your life, that's important. In every area of, of your entire life, it's important. We are swimming upstream and against the current. Now, whether you're trying to have a healthy marriage a healthy relationship with your kids, you know, overcome bitterness or anger, deal with a difficult boss, or, or pursue a relationship with God in a culture that is not going to facilitate your relationship with God. In every area of life, that's important. Academically, it's, it's always upstream. 
But here's what we know. It's worth it. Because wherever you have to make the effort to better yourself, wherever you have to make the effort to overcome an obstacle, overcome a relationship, you know, get out of that situation that's dragging you down. It takes a lot of effort, but it's worth it. You're swimming upstream, but it's worth it. Here is one of the core tenets of Christianity. And here's one of the things that's so central to everything we do as a group of churches. When it comes to swimming upstream, we have not been called to swim alone. We've been called to swim together. That's the power of Christian community. Because when you're in community with others, when you're in friendship with others, when you're in a circle with people who share your values and are trying to get to the same destination you are, it's so much easier. And in that capacity, we desperately, in a good way desperately, desperately, desperately need each other. Now, this isn't just a 21st century phenomenon. You know, one of the coolest things is, in the first century, when the church began, this was an issue then, and the first century writers actually addressed this in many different places throughout the New Testament. In the New Testament, there's a book called the Book of Hebrews. We don't know who the author is, but the early church embraced this book and loved what it said. It was so powerful and so spot on. Here is what the author says in chapter 3. He says this, See to it, or, or behold, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Look at those words. Turns away from the living God. Now, who in their right mind would turn away from the living God? I mean, who? Who would do that? Uh, who would, in, in their right mind, you, I mean, who knows the difference between right and wrong and, and know that God wants you to do what's right and then choose to do what's wrong? I mean, would, would you do that? Yeah, all of us, right? I mean, I won't ask you to raise your hand unless you're sitting at home alone. You can raise both hands, I guess. And that's why you're sitting at home alone, maybe. I don't know. But here's the point. This is so cool. He's saying, look, see this? See to it. That none of you who are in, in, in this case, Christians, you may not be a Christian out there. You may just believe in God. But he's saying, for those of you who are Christians, see to it that none of you have an unbelieving, sinful heart that turns away. In other words, he, the writer, recognizes the fact that you and I have the capacity. I have the capacity, regardless of, of what you say you believe, regardless of how long you've believed, we all have the capacity to turn away from the living God. Whew, ouch. That stings, doesn't it? The first century Christian writer who knew people that knew the risen Jesus, maybe this writer himself, had met the risen Christ. He says, regardless of what's happened, regardless of who you know or what you know, you have the capacity to turn your back on God. We can all do it. In fact, maybe the reason you're not in church right now, this very day, is because you've just gone through a season where you said, you're right. You know, I didn't use those terms, but that's what I've done. I've turned my back on God. Everything was going good. Then I turned away. Why? I mean, why do we do that in college? Why do we do that on a business trip? Why do we do that when we feel pressure, you know, going through the storms? Why do you do that after a string of bad luck? Why do we do that when things are going well after a string of good luck? The interesting thing is this. In this verse, the solution to drifting, in this verse, the solution to the problem of being tempted to turn our back on God when things get difficult, the solution is in this verse because this is not an individual imperative, an individual command. This is an all skate. This is a group command. I mean, notice the plurals here. I mean, look, look, look at this. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of y'all has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. It's not an individual thing. It's all y'all have a sinful, unbelieving heart that can turn away. The whole lot of you. In other words, here's what the author is saying. Y'all need 
to see about each other. That's what he's saying. That's the point. Y'all see about each other. Pay attention to this. Y'all need to check up on each other. You need to look around, see that person across the circle. This isn't just we, me making sure Doug doesn't have a sinful, unbelieving heart. This is plural. This is a group thing. Y'all need to see after each other to make sure that you all don't have an unbelieving heart. Because the heart that turns away from God, this is so important. The heart that turns away from God is something that happens within all of us, right? The turn away from God begins in the heart, and that's why he says an unbelieving heart that can turn away from God. So here's the thing. When we begin to turn away from God and we begin to kind of lose our focus, lose interest in him, when we begin to drift, the drift always begins not on the outside. The drift begins within. The drift always begins with a temptation within, within a, within a doubt or a question mark. The drift begins with uh, me wondering why. I'm not so sure about that. I'm not sure I believe anymore. I'm kind of getting tired of that. I'm, I'm bored. I'm not really interested anymore. The drift always begins within and nobody knows unless somebody is seeing about you. No, nobody knows unless somebody has access to you. And the thing is, the access to you and the scene about you is not going to happen in here because rows don't know, right? Rows don't know. A drifting heart doesn't show in a row. It doesn't show, uh, you know, in lines of people because we're so good at walking into church, looking good, come in the minivan, everybody's fussing and fighting, right? You're mad. You're, you're just stressed out. Stop, pause, exhale, straighten your hair, fix your makeup, tell the kids, okay, we'll pick this up when we get back in the car. And you get out of the minivan, get out of the SUV, whatever, and everybody looks, church, 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 put your smiles on. We're at church, right? Got a smile. And we're in rows, 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 and, and then you get back into the minivan and things fall apart. We're so good at that, right? Nobody knows. Nobody knows in a row. The only way anybody's going to know about your sinful, unbelieving, drifting heart is if you're in a circle with others and they have access to you. Now, in my world, I'm constantly reminded of this because in my world, I get these phone calls all the time. You know, marriage is on the rocks. And then I realize, hmm, I haven't seen them too much lately. They're disconnected from their small group. They disconnected years ago from their small group. And at that point, you know what? It's probably too late. Or it's the kids acting out. Nobody knows because they're not connected in. The parents aren't connected in. And the teens aren't connected to anything. No circles. There's not much we can do about it then. But when you're connected to a circle, guess what? Everybody's praying. Everybody's encouraging you, supporting you. It's hard to drift when you're in a circle. If, if you're only shoulder to shoulder then everybody else in your world, well, they don't know. Nobody knows. Rows don't know. Circles know. That's why circles are more important than rows. Otherwise, we swim alone. Otherwise, we struggle upstream alone. Rows don't know. So the writer goes on. He says, look, I don't want you to have a sinful, unbelieving heart that drifts away. But now he gives us an imperative. Starts with an adversative, then an imperative, but encourage one another. Encourage. Now, the little Greek word there translated in encourage does not mean like, um, you know, hey, way to go. Good job. Looking good today. You know? No, it doesn't mean that at all. In this capacity, this little Greek word translated encourage actually means appeal to, exhort, urge strongly, beg implore, entreat. It's translated this way throughout the Bible. This little Greek word means here, I want you to be in each other's lives. I want you to know what's going on. I want you to be able to, to, to detect when somebody begins to drift. I want you to notice when they don't show up. I want you to notice when their attitude goes south. And I want you to be in their life to the degree that you can actually say something about it. So that a wife 
never has to struggle alone between something only she and her husband knows about. So a husband doesn't ever have to struggle alone between about something that only he or she knows about. That teenagers don't have to struggle alone about something that's going on at home that nobody knows that's going on or what's going on in home except the people in that circle of a family. Now think for a minute, for some of you, not all of you, but for many of you, think how different your family that you grew up with, your family of origin, your parents, your brothers and sisters, think how differently things might have turned out if only, if only your father or if only your mother or both sets, you know, both parents had been in a relationship with a circle where there were people who would say, hey, 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 can we talk? Let's, let, let's talk about this. Hey, I noticed this. Hey, hey, is everything okay? Imagine the difference it would have made. And, and for many of you, for many of us, your parents probably showed up in rows almost every single Sunday. But rows don't know. They didn't know because it doesn't show in a row. But he says, encourage each other. Look at this. It kind of gets right up in their face. But encourage one another. How often? Daily. As long as it is called today. Literally, this means day after day after day. And it doesn't mean literally daily. It means it needs that it could be it's, a, it's an ongoing, continuous thing. This is not a once-in-a-lifetime thing. This is a relational thing that you have access to people and they have access to you on a day-to-day -day basis. And he says, encourage each other, as long as it is called today. And this is a reference to the fact that we live in an age where we constantly need this kind of encouraging. He says, as long as you're alive, as long as, you know, as we're in this generation of people that struggle with sin and struggle with temptation, you need to be in each other's lives. You need to be in someone else's life. Then there's a little Greek word that indicates that the author is going to give a purpose statement for everything that came before. Everything that came before, he says this, as long as, as it is called today, so that, so that, that's the little purpose statement, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Why? In the New Testament, the authors so often personify sin, which means they would talk about sin if, if it is, was an entity, almost as if it was a person, as if it was a living, active, breathing thing on the inside of us. And when I say that, most of us would probably say, well, that's because it is a living thing on the inside of me. I experience it all the time. It's alive. We think of sin as an activity, but Really, it's something that's within me. It's deeper, way deeper. There's a sin residing within me. And the, and the way this actually works is we talk ourselves into doing stupid things. We deceive ourselves. We begin this self-talk and it's always what's driving us. Like, well, you know, she deserved it. She's practice, practically forced me to do this. You know, I almost don't have any choice. I mean, who would blame me? If everybody at work knew what was going on, in fact, I don't even think I want to be married anymore. I think I'd be happier. I think I'd be more fulfilled. I, I, I think I'd be more satisfied if only we have this self-talking mechanism going on. Before long, we start doing the stupid things that we have told ourselves, right? That's how it goes. The writer is saying the best defense against self-deceit self the best defense against talking stupid to ourselves, the best defense is not you. The best defense is not me. The best defense is we. Here's some really bad grammar, but it's true. We is the best defense against the deceitfulness of me. Your best defense against the things that you have a tendency to tell yourself that aren't true, it's us together. We've all, most of us, have lived long enough to know that this is absolutely the case, that we, the circle, the community, is the best defense against the deceitfulness of sin in me. So let's just play a little game right now, real quick. Don't answer this question out loud. So here's the question. What are you telling yourself these days? Don't suppress it. Just kind of bring it right up to the front and center, right up to the surface. What is it that you're telling yourself these days? You know, what's that thing? 
you know, I don't believe I, I don't think I don't believe in this stuff anymore. I, I don't know why we have to do this. I, I, I think I'll check out. What is it when you're alone and your brain is drifting? What is it that you have begun to tell yourself these days? What is it you're telling yourself these days that if, that if you were to tell someone else what you're thinking, you'd, they'd say you lost your mind. Here's the power of what the writer is saying. That when we take those potentially self-destructive thoughts, those potentially, you know, I'm going to lie to myself thoughts, when you get them out and you get them out in front of somebody else or somebody's else, and they begin to say back to you something different, and suddenly you see it differently. And yes, they may think you're crazy, but they may keep you from crazy. Again, think about your worst mistake ever. Don't you wish now that somebody had been there in your life kind of to talk back to you? What if somebody had been there for your father or mother or brother or sister? That's the power of community. This is the power of circles. That's why we need circles so badly. So here's the point of what he's saying. The drift begins within. So let someone in. The drift begins right here within always. But if you allow someone in while it is within, it will keep you from things that you just will regret later on. I know this about you and don't intend, you know, I know it about me. If you don't intend to abandon this whole thing of Christianity, you have to pay attention to the little things and, and the way that you pay attention to the little things is by allowing someone in. I encourage you, get involved in a circle. You will be glad you did because at the end of the day, we all need seeing too. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, the words of this writer, the writer from the book of Hebrews. And we pray, God, that you will help us to let others in so that they may help us stay away from the deceitfulness within. God, we all need others. We need you, Lord, working through others. We need community. So, Father, I pray that you will inspire every person who's listening today. And, God, that together, all of us together, might be a part of something so much bigger than just ourselves. That we'll be a part of circles, small groups, communities. Thank you, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much for watching today. God bless.
Well, thank you again for joining us today. We believe that there is a next step for you to take today to further connect with God and with other people. And if you're new with us, we invite you to fill out a connect card and let us know that you're new. You can do that by heading to faithauburn.info and clicking the link that says connect card. Another simple next step is to share this service to your own Facebook page. We believe that God has surrounded you with people who need the good news of Jesus. And sharing the service is a great way to start that conversation with other people. Another way to further connect is by attending one of our in-person services, which happen every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m., with our kids' service happening at the 11 a.m. service. For all signups and next steps, visit faithauburn.info, and we'd love to help you get connected this season. Thanks again for watching, and we hope you have a great week.